what's happening in the economy is obviously huge, and I know we'll talk about that. And um, what's happening with um, policing and communities and things is a big deal. But the NHS is, I think, the, um, the biggest threat and the biggest worry and um, the biggest frustration about being in opposition. Because, you know, try as we might, and Andy Burnham's done brilliantly in the last few months, John Healy laid the foundations, the lords, the crossbenchers, but this legislation has still gone through. And it's, um, it is, it's terrible. And uh, it's going to, um, if we're not careful, destroy something which has been built for 50 years. And, you know, it's hard enough having the toughest financial settlement since 1948, overlaying upon this something which really destabilises the, the fundamentals of the whole system. And, you know, I see this, obviously, the national debates and in Parliament, but actually from our own um, constituency aspect in um, w my constituency crosses Leeds and Wakefield, so the Mid-Yorkshire Trust, which has been having a very challenging time, but Leeds. And what you just see is um, public officials in the NHS, you know, the people from the primary care trusts, the GPs, the, um, the consultants, the nurses, the staff, all having in different ways to try and gear up for this change, but deeply fearful. I've not met anybody in any senior position implementing the reforms who doesn't fear them. Um, talking about reversing things, the, what would you reverse from last week's budget? Would you, would you, the 50p top rate tax, would you raising the personal threshold? What would you cancel straight away? I think um, that there's a long list of individual things I'd reverse. Let's come to that. Actually, it's philosophically and strategically wrong, the budget. Um, the, the, the fundamental view that the government can walk away, that you need, that, that less government delivers, that cutting faster on spending and raising taxes will be strengthening for the economy, but more than that, that if you cut the public sector, the private sector grows and flourishes and is liberated. I think philosophically, that's flawed. And what George Oswald actually wanted last Wednesday was people to say his plan's working, and it's not working. And that's the big thing. So, you know, what I would want is a fundamentally different direction. Now, within that, you know, as well as saying you've got to have a view of jobs, growth, and the economy, which is fundamentally different, within that, um, what they also did was deeply unfair. And uh, the reason why um, the pensioners um, change has hit the headlines is because it was a surprise because um, it was clearly not what George Osborne ever intended one or two years ago. He thought by this time the plan would be working, so therefore he would be cutting taxes for pensioners, for families, rather than having to raise them for some people. And, um, and people, I think, think it's not fair, but uh, the biggest, um, if you like, philosophical <laughs> statement is the top rate of tax. And a philosophical statement, but also, if I'm honest with you, the sort of dissembling dishonesty of the government was exposed by it. If you listen to David Cameron and George Osborne in the House of Commons last Wednesday, you would have thought the top rate of tax didn't work, didn't really raise any money, the cost of this is only 100 million, nobody's really gaining or losing from this top rate of tax if we cut it, and we're going to take five times more from a rise in the stamp duty and tackling tax avoidance, and therefore we're the progressives, so we're hitting the rich. But it's a complete lie. It's just not true. Were you surprised when um, George Osborne said that he doesn't pay the top rate of tax? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so his, his salary is 135,000. He um, has a trust fund from the Osborne and Little wallpaper uh, company. And um, he, um, he has rent on his house. I thought, the, um, the thing, I thought was, what was interesting is when he talked about people who move the location of their homes offshore to avoid stamp duty. Like rock stars. He, yeah. He used a language of morality and said, you know, that this is morally repugnant. But when he talked about um, people who organise their own tax affairs to end up managing to avoid the um, top rate of tax, his language ended up being rather more morally neutral. <laughs> It's a very bleak way of putting it. I know, but everybody knows what I mean. <laughs> <laughs>
also looking on Twitter yesterday, I noticed that you were seen running around Regent's Park yesterday in very tight, unedifying trousers. Oh dear. Why? <laughs> uh, because um, completely madly, um, I decided to um, run the London Marathon in four weeks' time. So I'm finally at my peak of training. And yesterday I did um, 11 miles, four circuits, four weeks to go. And uh, so it's quite right. nerve-wracking, but I've um, right. been training quite hard. I came into The Guardian a few weeks ago to do a, a lunch um, with um, the, the columnists, having done 10 miles around Clissold Park in the previous two hours. And um, I could barely speak. <laughs> So are you going to finish? You, is this, it would be quite embarrassing if you didn't. Well, that, that is probably why no cabinet or shadow cabinet member has ever done it before. <laughs> so um, it's probably a crazy thing. The story is that uh, I did a um, charity fundraiser for a brilliant children's charity called WizKids a year and a half ago. And um, I was, so I was a speaker, 50 people there. And the, um, the head of WizKids, because they have about 500 people doing the marathon, um, she said, great news. Um, I can announce to you this evening, Ed Balls has agreed to run the marathon for Whiskers. And they all burst into applause. It was total news to me. Oh, Nobody had... <laughs> so I went into denial for six months and refused to talk about it, reinforced by a vet, and then decided a year ago to have a go, to, or at least to see whether I could have a go. So I'm going to run it for Whiskers and for a charity called Action for Stammering Children, who run the Michael Palin Centre for Stammering Children in London, and in, in Leeds. Uh, the problem is, you have to know whether you can finish, or at least have a good chance. So my longest run so far is 18 miles last weekend in three hours, 45 minutes. And, um, is that good? Is that good? <laughs> yesterday was 11 miles, two hours, two. So I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be that fast, to be honest. I'll, I'll, be, have you got a target time? Um, I think, to be quite honest, just to finish would yeah. be absolutely Not fair. on your knees? I hope not, I hope not. Basically, I've trained a lot. I've had a really good um, person to tell you how to do it. And what, they, what you actually do is you spend... I spent six months training, doing no running, doing step and flexi bar, and just trying to get strong again, because, you know, to be honest, I wasn't hugely fit. And, um, and I started running in October. So I'm five months in, so fingers crossed it'll be OK. Good luck.